Hey guys, I'll be right there. Hello. Yeah, hello. Hello. Yeah, Tonelli here. I'll be right there. Are we live? Uh, I think so without having started the meeting yet. Yeah, I, uh, we're, we're all logging in. I'm just printing some things off that just came through. Hey, did you get a haircut finally? You look a lot better. Uh, actually, actually, I got a haircut and now it's growing back. And now and, and uh, I used some new conditioner today that puffed it up. So I, I'm in between. <laughs> you, are, you are wavy gravy over there, man. Yeah, I know. I'm wavy gravy. That's what I... You know, and the, the other thing is, it's amazing how fast masks go out of style. This one was so in last week, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and like, like that, it's, all, it's out of style. I can't believe it. There you go. Yeah. Such a fickle market. I know. I, I was actually going to wear my Santa hat tonight for you, but I, and I might do it later. I just did not want to get things shot at me tonight. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I see Paul is on, but maybe he's logging in to get the, I'm here. I'm here. I'm he's just, on. Paul's on. I, I hear him. Yeah. No, I'm here. We have one more, one more, uh, commissioner that's coming or have you, are you there? Nancy? I don't know. I, I don't see Lisa on here either. Yeah. We're going to, oh, there's Lisa. She, she's on page two of your uh, display. George oh. is here too. Man, we got all kinds of. Uh, hey, Rich. I see Rich. I see Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Rich. Whoa. Van, we got everybody on here. Yeah. I have one uh, phone number that could possibly be Nancy. Nancy, are you on the line on the phone number ending in 2244? a document that came in just uh, moments ago to, to my email that I'm printing, but it's printing amazingly slow. I don't know why. I'm going to wait for our, our last commissioner to call in. I still have gifts to deliver to grandchildren. We got them some stuff, and then we were, we're going to take some more stuff after the first of the year down. So, yep. It's the Christmas that keeps giving. Everybody do Zoom Christmas. We were Zooming with uh, grandkids and daughters and all kinds of people on Christmas. Definitely a different one, wasn't it? It was different. I'll wait a couple, uh, a couple more minutes for Nancy. Lisa, she, she did confirm that she would be able to make this meeting. Is that correct? I believe so, Jacob. 
Does that sound right? Yes, I have not heard anything otherwise. Yeah. All right, we have a couple more minutes. For those of you on the line, we're waiting for one more commissioner. Uh, or in a couple more minutes, we'll go without her. And then when she joins, uh, we'll determine what role she can play, depending on when she gets here. Yeah, this is the slowest printing document I've ever received. Lisa, I, there's no minutes from our last meeting to approve. Is that correct? That's correct. Those minutes will be at your next regular meeting. Okay. And you do have a quorum, so if you would like yeah, to start, no. we're ready whenever you are. I know. I just don't want. I don't want her to get here after we start uh, doing things that she can't do. Get me involved in. That's why I'm trying to give her a little bit of a break. We had another phone number just join. Um, Nancy Lerner, if you're on the line, please introduce yourself. Yes, I'm sorry, my computer wouldn't work, so I'm on the telephone instead. Excellent. <laughs> I'm Nancy good. Lerner, I'm a planning commissioner. The, the chair had all the faith that you would be joining us and we were waiting for you. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, I'm sorry to be late. It's just a mechanical that's, problem. Yes. That's all right, that's all right. I, we, were, we wanted to make sure that you were in on the party. All right. Uh, um, Thank you. Uh, I'm the chair of the planning commission, and then we'll go ahead and I brought my uh, my uh, uh, gavel with me, and so we'll go ahead and uh, 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 start the planning commission for December 28th uh, uh, meeting. Uh, we'll start with a roll call. Thank you, Chair Lane. Here, Commissioner Tonelli. Let me unmute. Here, Commissioner Lamb. Here, Commissioner Lerner. Here. Commissioner Narancic. Here. All right, that's good. Then, uh, then the next item, item number two, is we on all of our planning commission meetings, we have a, a section for items that are not on the agenda that where an individual who's part of the meeting can bring up an item that's not on the agenda that maybe deals with something we dealt with in the past or in the future. But uh, we want to make sure we make time for something to be brought forward uh, to the commission to be aware of. So uh, I'll go ahead and open the public uh, uh, item number two for public comments of items not on the agenda. We'll go ahead and open the public comment section. I'm looking for anyone who's interested in uh, discussing something that's not on the agenda. I don't see anybody raising their hand or, or waving or anything. So I'm going to go ahead and close the the public uh, hearing on that item number two, and then go to that, uh, item number three, disclosure of uh, communications. Uh, Lisa, do you wanna start with, uh, Mona, you wanna do this one? Yes, thank you, Chair Lane. Um, this item requests all members of the Planning Commission to disclose any community or applicant that's before you tonight, Sacred Heart Schools or Menlo School in addition to any members of the public. The purpose of disclosing ex-party communications is just to identify the person, um, a brief summary of what you have spoken to about, so that for, for purposes of due process, um, all parties present at this public meeting um, know what uh, discussions have taken place and the applicant has the ability to rebut or respond to any of the communications that may have occurred. All right. Anyone, anyone have to disclose anything on that? I've had none. Nope. No. Nope. None. I've, 
I've talked to I talked to Lisa before and told them about the setup. Uh, someone has a phone on and a computer on. So if you've got I need to have two of them. Yeah. 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 What have I done? Someone who has oh, a phone there on you and a, there you go. That'll do it. Yeah, sometimes when somebody has a computer on and a phone in the same room or in the same vicinity, that does that. Um, at least and I went over the 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 item on the phone, uh, uh, you know, just to make sure that uh, we were we were prepared for the meeting. And uh, uh, Stephanie uh, called me last week, uh, 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 the associate planner or the assistant planner, to tell me that Lisa was going to talk to me. So those are the only two contacts I've had as chair. All right, is that it? For me. Is that covered, Mona? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think that we also, um, it's, it's not on the agenda, but if any of the planning commissioners have any conflicts of interest, we'll go one by one. So we'll start with, before we get into the conditional use permit application for Menlo School, if any planning commissioner has a conflict of interest that would preclude them from participating in this, now would be the time to identify that. A, a conflict of interest would include any economic interest, um, business entity, dependents, or so forth. So um, asking that for item 4A, please. This is Randy, none for me. Paul Tonelli, none for me. Harry Noransic, none for me. Nancy, anything on that? I'm still working on this. Yeah, darn it. I've, I've got your picture there, Eric. Oh, okay. do you? Okay. I'm getting on then. Shall I hang up the phone and go for the... I'll hang up the phone then and go for the... You can see me. Yeah, that's that's all right. You're, you, can, you can either put on your camera... Uh, Whatever, use what you're using right now and make sure the phone's uh, uh, muted. All right, I hung up the phone. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Good. All right. The question, the question was, hey. do you have any, uh, do you have any conflict of interest on this item? Any, Mona, would you go over the criteria again one more time for Nancy? Yes. If you have any conflicts of interest that would preclude your participation on item 4A, which is a conditional use permit for Menlo School, please identify that now. A conflict of interest could be, for example, um, any business entity, economic interest, or otherwise that would impact your decision making. No, I don't. This is Nancy. And it's Eric. I don't either. So with that, then we'll 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 go to the public hearing on item 4A, and just I'll just go do an overview of the process that we use on all items. Uh, uh, in the first, what we'll do is we'll get an overview from staff on the item. Uh, and then the commissioners can ask staff uh, any questions and we'll open up the public hearing. We'll start with the applicant They're going over uh, their item and then the, the commissioners can ask questions to them. And then we'll open up to the general public for comments uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, then close the hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion and action as appropriate. And we'll do this on all items and I'll and I'll go, you may hear me uh, go over this uh, uh, outline again, because someone who enters late, I want to make sure they understand the process that we're using so they have a chance to be involved in the, in the process that they have to say. So with that, so then uh, for uh, the Menlo School application, that, uh, for uh, we'll go ahead and open it up. Uh, Lisa, will you give us the overview? And also there's some, there some correspondence received too that we're going to highlight too. Yes, thank you. I'll be giving the staff presentation and um, Jacob will be assisting me by advancing the slides. So good evening, Lisa Costa Sanders, town planner, and I'm here to present Menlo School's request for a conditional use permit. Next. Menlo School requests a conditional use permit to allow temporary lights to accommodate athletic activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Menlo School's request is specific to football team practice and training. Menlo School has modified their request since the preparation of the public notice to remove the use of Wonderlook Field. So the request is for the date ranges of January 19th through March 12th, having lights on weekdays only between the hours of 3.45 p.m. until 6.15 p.m. 
and that would be limited to uh, Cartan football field only. And this, um, this conditional use permit only applies to that date range that I just mentioned. Next slide. The Cartan football field is located adjacent to El Camino Real at the corner of Alejandra Avenue. Single family homes are located to the west across from the baseball field on Brittany Meadows and single family homes are located to the north across the creek along Isabella. Next. As shown on this map, Menla School proposes to locate up to six temporary lights right, along the football field in this appro approximate configuration. The temporary lights are low level lights that will be directed downward towards the field to have minimal light spillover. The lights are powered by diesel generators. Menla School was able to rent a light and conduct a noise test. And that test was verified by an Atherton police officer who utilized town equipment to confirm that the um, generator does comply with the town's noise ordinance. Next. The conditional use permit request by Menlo School is limited to temporary lights for a limited duration during the COVID-19 pandemic. A conditional use permit is a land use entitlement that grants a property owner and their successors an opportunity to use a property in a way that is not permitted by right in the town, assuming certain conditions are met. A conditional use permit was granted by the town in 1965 for the use of Cartan Field for an outdoor physical exercise field. Um, a conditional use permit or any of the conditions can be modified and new use permits can be granted by the Planning Commission under your zoning authority. The school's request is for a temporary use permit only and not an amendment to the 1965 use permit. So that use permit will still be in effect. And the request tonight is for just a temporary use to allow the lights for a limited duration. The school is also required to comply with any county and state COVID-19 regulations for the activities that will occur on the field and all other town regulations remain in effect, including compliance with the town's noise ordinance. Next, the school did send a, a letter to the neighbors informing them of the proposed project and staff also mailed and published notice of the public hearing to all property owners within 500 feet of the site, as well as publication in the Almanac. Staff received request to continue this item after the notice was mailed and published. Staff is bringing the item forward for the commission to consider. If the commission needs more time, you are able to extend the public hearing. Um, as noted, um, the adjacent neighbors have expressed concern and you've received uh, numerous emails this afternoon expressing concern with impacts with increased noise, that this is a precedent setting to allow lights in the future, as well as risk of increased COVID infections due to activities. Um, as noted previously, the school is required to comply with state and county COVID regulations, and the use is required to comply with the town's noise ordinance. Finally, the city attorney can expand on this, but this is a unique situation due to the COVID pandemic and is not precedent setting on any future request. Next item. This is the motion, should you wish to grant it. As you are aware, conditional use permits are discretionary if the Planning Commission is able to make the required findings. Um, those findings are found in the zoning code and listed in your staff report. The commission can modify the findings and the determinations and we'd be happy to um, respond to any questions that you have. That concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Any questions of staff then at this point? None for me. All right. All right, no. can you go ahead and drop the uh, slides at this point then so we can have a full screen if we have a screen that's big enough? Thank you. All right, then I'll go ahead and uh, and then we'll start with the applicant and uh, or their representative. Let's, uh, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing and we'll start with the applicant. Dan. Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm Than Healy, head of school at Menlo School. I'm here tonight with Earl Koberlein, our athletics director. Uh, maybe the best way to start, I, th I thought Lisa did a nice job of summarizing uh, what we're asking for this evening. Um, the truthful way to start is that nobody is less interested in being here tonight than I am. Uh, 
we wish we weren't in COVID. We wish we're, our schools weren't facing what they're facing. Um, and we're all doing the best that we can with the situation that we face. This is part of our, this, this request tonight is part of our response and our efforts to try to make things as um, somewhat normal as possible for our kids. So let me just sort of run down some things that uh, weren't covered in the staff report that might be helpful to you this evening. Um, you may not know that <laughs> athletics has been constrained since last March. Interschool competition in California hasn't been approved by the CCS or the CIF since last March. Um, I think it's common knowledge that movement and fresh air as well as interaction with peers is really critical to the mental and physical health of our children. And since August, we've been, as soon as the state allowed, we've been running on-campus workouts for our athletes and any student, frankly, that wishes to join us. Uh, and we've done so successfully and safely. Uh, we've exceeded the guidelines established by the San Mateo Department of Health. Our athletes have been distanced, uh, masked when they're not exercising. They've been outdoors at all times. We sanitize all surfaces. We have mandatory weekly COVID testing that happens on our campus. Uh, we've also delivered a program with an even smaller impact on our neighbors. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to raise tonight. My hope is that you consider our request um, with the context that our neighbors have been spared any noise or field usage in nearly six months between March and August and significantly reduced noise since August. No games, no traffic, no crowds, uh, no, no spectators. Uh, as you heard from staff, what we're asking for tonight is really quite simple. Now that the days are getting darker earlier and the county has made it clear that we're not allowed to move our athletics activities indoors, which is a decision that I think we all should support. We'd like to maintain some semblance of athletics program for students who want to participate in specifically for our, our, our football team. The application before you re re reflects what we think is an exceedingly conservative request in our opinion. Uh, as you heard, we're requesting the use of limited low throw lights on weekdays until 6.15 between January 19th and March 14th, well, March 12th, um, which is nine weeks. But I want to be clear that uh, any day that we don't, um, we're not in session, so weekends, uh, school holidays, uh, professional development days, any time when we can practice during the day, that's in everybody's best interest. Um, not, not just our athletes, but our, our neighbors as well. So when you factor those days out, what we're really asking for is 33 total days between March, uh, between January 19th and March uh, 12th. Um, and, and, and so it's really a quite limited ask. Originally we had asked for the use of Carton Field with uh, the artificially turfed Wonderlick Field as a backup should rain occur. We've since withdrawn uh, that second request for using Wonderlick as a backup and we're only concentrating on uh, carton field at this time. Um, there is some, there, there's a couple of things that I think uh, are, are maybe have led to some confusion and I just want to uh, clear this up. Um, in fact, the end of our school day is 3.30 in the afternoon and we are determined to start practice as early as we possibly can, but it's important to keep in mind that even in January, if we were lucky enough to have 50% of our students on campus, which we intend to try to do, half of our students are also gonna be participating from home and will need to get to campus safely to be able to participate in practices. So 3.30 is, is a legitimate end time to our school day. And, and uh, we anticipate that, that that's part of the fact that our, some of our student athletes are gonna to need to drive from home it's part of the reason that we need to go a little bit later than we would had we had everybody on campus um, like normal. Um, I think those are the major things that uh, I'd like to add to uh, staff's report. Um, I guess I would only add this. Um, there is a chance that we won't use this conditional use permit at all. Um, there's a chance that the CIF or the CCS in their wisdom will decide that um, football won't happen this year or that it won't happen in this time frame, and they'll push it back to later in the spring or until such time that uh, our county has a, a lower rating on the uh, pandemic scale. Um, and if that happens, obviously we won't, we won't need to use these 
uh, lights to continue our practices uh, for football. So there's a chance none of this gets used at all, but we feel like this is the right thing to do for our students um, to try to keep them healthy and, and safe, frankly. So um, that's why we brought it forward uh, uh, for you to consider today. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what we're asking for. We've done everything in our power to try to reduce the impact on our neighbors. Uh, we, we ran a test. We invited Atherton Police Department to come to that test. Um, um, they used their equipment. We used ours. I think both, both sets of sound monitors uh, registered well below the Atherton uh, noise limit. We feel confident that we can meet the expectations of the town uh, where we granted this condition use permit. So maybe I'll stop there and invite any questions of uh, Mr. Koberlein or myself. Okay. Uh, I have some questions, but uh, Paul, did you have some too? I see you came off mute. Uh, well, first of all, um, at least specifically in Menlo's case, are you saying then, am I hearing you say that you're only going to be using the lights for football practice? Earl? Yeah, Paul, that, that is correct. Yeah, Earl, um, Earl, Earl, before you start, could you go ahead and introduce yourself just yes, for the record? Hi, everyone. I'm Earl Kerberlein. I'm the athletic director at Menlo School. And Paul, you are correct. It will just be for football practice. Um, and really, as Than said, it's 33 days, but it's really like an hour each day. Um, it gets light. We're not going to, you know, we start practice as early as we can, 345 or 4 by the time kids get there. The lights would come on when it gets dark or right before it gets dark, 5-ish. And then we in practice at 6. And then we have a little 15 minutes of cleanup. We've, uh, so it's like hour and 15 minutes per day for 33 days we're looking at and to clarify the reason we're asking this is football is normally in the fall as you may or may not know and light's not an issue um, because it's, it's the days are longer in the fall since the covid they've postponed the season till winter and now since we don't have lights and getting dark around five we're up to five we're in this predicament so by no means are we wanting to ask for lights in any normal any normal year so what kind of indication, if any, have you gotten from either CCS or CIF about football? Because I know it was originally going to start like December 14th or the middle part of December, and then it got postponed. And I'm wondering if they're just keeping you in the dark or if they're giving you any indication of what they may be deciding. Yeah, we've, we've got no uh, new indication. Uh, you're right. They, they originally started in the summer. They said they're going to push it back to the December 14th. That's been pushed back now to, I think the earliest start date is December 16th for practice. Um, and they're gonna, excuse me, January 16th. Mm -hmm. And then January 4th, there's supposed to be an update. And uh, I was looking at sunrise, sunset schedules between January and uh, the middle of March when we get into the time change. We're looking at, uh, on the short end, about 10 after five when you guys uh, start with this request on January 4th. So, and as you already, Earl, as you already mentioned, you're not gonna be using that full two and a half hours because of sunset kicking in at 510, 515. I know it gets a little bit dark before that. The question is, who's gonna be making a decision as to when those lights get switched on uh, when, they're, when they're necessary at a practice? Well, I'll probably powwow with our coach and so when, it, when it's needed to be safely put on, as, right. as it starts to get dusky and dark for the safety of the kids we'll flip, flip them on if you before it gets dark totally for sure so, okay and, and then in your estimation you're looking at an hour and 15 minutes uh five to six fifteen maybe shortly before five o'clock is it is that where yeah, you're roughly, roughly yep okay thank you all right Perry, you have any questions or randy or or nancy no none for me it sounds very clear same, same. And I, I uh, Paul, I, I was looking at the same sunset schedule and even at the latter part of what Menlo's asking for it, it sun goes down around 613. So it's even, right. even later. So anyway, yeah, I'm good. All right. Uh, I have some questions. First of all, how many, how many students are we talking about here that are involved in the program? We have about uh, 80 students in the JV and varsity teams right now. How many of them are off campus of that? So what I'm looking for on this is how, how much of a change would it be for the candidate and for the 
students who are off campus to adjust their schedules to be on campus to be during the football practice season so that it didn't start late. So I can answer that one, Eric. Um, I think it's fair to, so when we ran our algorithm for which students would be in which groups on campus, we started by keeping families together um, so that siblings weren't coming in different weeks <clears throat> and increasing the infection potential, um, both for ourselves and for the community. Uh, we then um, moved to trying to balance out classes so that you wouldn't have in an 18 student class, the second priority in the algorithm is to have as close to nine and nine on the, on the varying weeks as possible. And you wouldn't have 16 and two, which of course defeats the purpose of trying to um, uh, keep kids from concentrating in bigger groups. Um, and when we ran those two variables in the algorithm, we, we, we pretty much defined what the groupings were gonna be of the week one and week two groups, or as we call them, the blue and gold groups. We don't have, you can't, you can't believe the number of requests I got to keep friend groups together, um, but keeping the football team together would be akin to that. So I think it's safe to assume that about half of the students would be off campus at any given time. And to shift the algorithm would be to prioritize football over public safety and, and student safety. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do, but okay. it's a reasonable question. Right. Um, there's no way that you could have known <laughs> the, the right. thought that goes into these kinds of things. So, so would it be normal to have practice uh, late on a Friday? There'll be some of those. Um, once we start playing games, we'll have games on Friday. Um, so they won't pra be practice on some of those Fridays. We either so, play Friday or Saturday. But normally, the, normally in the fall, when we the normal season, uh, practice does go about 6, 6.30. Okay, so, and normally you wouldn't need lights for that practice, but it would be happening on that field. Correct. Uh, so the challenge at, with practice time, Eric, is, is, is one of safety from, from our perspective. This is gonna be a shortened season. Our athletes hadn't had a chance to, to prepare. And unlike basketball, water polo, cross country, this is a collision sport. And so we do feel some responsibility to prepare our athletes for it, we're relatively undersized right, relative to the to the opponents that we play. Uh, and we feel like we need to teach them to tackle well, we need to teach them to tackle safely. And so the contact time is important for us. And so this is not about trying to build an empire. It really is about keeping kids safe in a shortened season when we haven't had the chance to kind of do the kinds of drills that we would need to do in a, in a typical season. Mm -hmm. And on the game days, what time does the game start? If it's a weeknight game, it'll start at seven, it'll take place off campus. And so that would be a day when we don't use the lights at all. Um, if it's a weekend game, it happens on a Saturday during during like daylight hours. Earl, is that 10 o'clock start, 11 o'clock start, something like that? Yeah, we use like, typically JV might be 11 and varsity one um, at home on a Saturday. When we play away, people, most people have lights and we'll play at seven o'clock on a Friday. All right, so back to Earl, then back to your previous answer to my question. When I said, when I talked about the Friday, you brought up the game uh, game days. So what what would be what would be a typical practice on a Friday? We wouldn't Friday. practice on Fridays if we had a game that day. You don't practice on Fridays? No, so it's another day that we wouldn't have the lights out there. All right. If there's a game, we don't practice on Fridays. Right, so, so, so what I'm trying to get at is, is I kind of feel like the application is too broadly stated for the actual impact. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, uh, isn't there a, is there a holiday in there? I mean, is it, I don't know if you guys are shut down on Martin Luther King Day or Columbus Day or. Uh, so those 33 days that I quoted you earlier, uh, remove the, the President's Day week when we're, when we're out. Uh, they remove the professional development days, and I have to go back and, and relook at that, but I th I, there's at least two and maybe three in that window. Um, we take out any day when we are not in session uh, for any reason, weekends, uh, holidays, or professional development days. And so that's, and, and we're happy to limit the scope or even enumerate which days we're talking about, if that's helpful. We don't have a schedule yet, Commissioner Lane, so we don't know what the what the games would be which games would be on friday you know if this even happens back to commissioner tonelli's question 
there's a very good chance that the leagues will restrict who you can play games against to people in the teams in the immediate county or adjacent counties. There's, there's just a ton of speculation as to what restrictions might be imposed if the season even happens. Um, we would certainly be happy to produce a schedule as soon as we have one, but we're as in the dark on, on this as, as anybody else on this call. Right. All right. So, so again, I, I think it will be very critical that we actually talk specifically about what days we're talking about. And also if, if there are days that would be, uh, uh, you know, less likely to use my inclination would be to say we're not using them. So if Friday is a less likely day to use, for that period, then then we we're talking about Monday through Thursday rather than that, and not every not every Monday through Thursday because of the week off. I, I think part of the part of the uh, sort of concern about this is what the actual impact is, right? And I think I think that's really important because we got to solve for three things: we got to solve solve for health and the and the and the and being responsible about the health, which is what you're doing in terms of whether or not you have a season at all. We have to solve for the neighbors so that they understand that we're trying to make sure that the impact is minimal. And the third is to, is to try to address the issue you're trying to address with the kids. So I, I understand that you've done some things with the scheduling, but uh, I, I still think there's some work to, to be worked out uh, on, on the specifics and so that people actually know what you're really asking for rather than what you're generally asking for. And I think that's, that, will, that, will help, uh, that will help us clarify some of the, some of the things. The other thing I was I uh, was uh, looking at is um, well I kind of guess you kind of answered it why that why the 16 15 time as opposed to earlier and that's because of the timing of, of the students off campus getting there uh, yeah and the amount of practice time that we we've cut the practice time back as far as we feel like we can cut it okay and the other question I had is does it require you to, to light the whole field. I mean, yeah, well, I, we'll have, like I said earlier, we'll have 80 players out there, two teams. We'll put the JVs and varsity out there at the same time. So we have a lot of kids out on the field. And so, yes, we'll need, we'll need a, the entire field. We, or we, if we just split it up, we'd have to go, you know, four to six, one team and six to nine, six to eight, another team. And we didn't want to do that. So we'll put them all on one field and light it. What's, what's your, what's your plan if the, if the, the, the lights aren't authorized for the period. We don't get to have a football season. Okay. So there's no plan. The, the plan is not to, not to, okay. We, right. we don't have other options. Eric, right. Eric, I have a question when you're done. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. That's all I have. Randy, you're up. Yeah, so, so let me just make sure I'm, I'm understanding this. this is Randy. So, so for you guys that are, they're asking for this. So if this were in the fall, nothing would be different about what you're asking us other than the fact that right now you're asking for lights, right? So in the fall, nothing's different. You're not going later. You're, you might be a little, you know, whatever. So, so really the difference is because of the daylight savings time, you're, you're asking for this in a different way, given that the fact that there's a pandemic and you've got kids on campus, you've got kids on camp, off campus. You're just trying to have some flexibility in here. I'm not as concerned about um, Eric, where you were going on, on, on setting specific days. Cause I, I mean, I, I think the last thing we want to do is tie their hands on this and make sure that, you know, we're now managing Menlo football. Um, well, let's 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 wait on that discussion until we hear from everyone well, no, else. I, I, well, I mean, you had your you had your time. Let me just finish. So, but here's my point: is during the fall, you guys wouldn't be doing anything different than you are now. You're just happening to go from mid January to or you know mid March. Correct. Nothing's different. Right. We would practice later in the fall. We we reduced our practice time to. To end at six, knowing that there's a, you know, this the light is an the lights are an issue for the neighbors. Trying to be cognizant of our neighbors, yet still be allowing our students to to have a, a season. Okay, during the fall, then to to ask that more, Earl. So how late? How much later would you have gone in the fall? I think our practice is typically in around six thirty in the fall. Okay, okay, so not much later, but later. Okay, all right, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, Eric, just one of the questions that came to mind, is, and I was kind of looking over the notes, maybe I missed something. Um, how many uh, temporary standards are you looking at to light the field then? We think we need six to cover the field sufficiently for safety. 
So that's six separate units? Correct. Like, what, I guess, what, three on each side then? Correct. A and um, uh, addressing Eric's concern about the days, uh, and I'm sure we'll address this a little bit later on, Eric, but yeah, I think it's a little difficult until the schools get more direction from the CIF to really nail it down at this point in a CUP because it's unknown what days the games are that would limit the practices on Friday and things like that. So I, I, I don't know how we would word things if it got to that point, but we do have to keep that in consideration that some of the scheduling is out of their hands. Yeah, does each of the lights have its own generator or do they run off of one generator or two generators? How does that work? Each one is powered by itself. Okay, thank you. So it's six generators. Sounds good. All right. So it'd be six generators. Correct. They have they have the motors in in contained in the unit. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Any anyone else, Nancy? Any questions, Barry? No. Yes, I would like to say something. Um, at the risk of sounding impertinent, I'm really surprised we're even having this discussion. We're talking about putting on lights until 6.15 in the afternoon or evening, as you may think. The good Lord keeps the whole town brightly lit until eight or nine o'clock at night through some of the year. What's the big deal here till 6.15 at night? They're having some lights on. I'm sorry. I just can't understand this. Well, let, let's let's hear from other people because they may have an, they may fill in the gaps on that. Uh, Perry, anything, any questions before I open it up to the rest of the uh, public? You want to you want to take your mute off though. It's easier to hear you that way. Thank you, uh, Eric. When you think it's appropriate, I have some questions of legal counsel. Okay, let's. Uh, if it's not related to to anything specific here, let's wait to the end then. Uh, it it is related to these applications. Yes. Okay. Well, the, but it's not related to what has been said here. We. What could be said by other people might affect your questions? No. No? All right. So, Mona, you want to do it now or do you want to move to the end of the public hearing? I think it makes sense. These are questions that are uh, applicable in general to both applications and I think are important to achieving a resolution. Maybe I'll pre maybe I'll preview them and then you determine when is the right time to, to go into detail. All right. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Ibrahimi, so I have two questions. Number one, apparently there was a an original permit. I think it goes back back to the '60s. Is that right? That original permit has certain conditions, right? Which include which relate to lighting or it says no lighting or no only down lighting or something of the sort, correct? Yes, that's correct. So, so the question is, um, is there a legal authority by the commission or the town council to modify that the conditions of the original permit? You don't have to answer yet because there's a part two. So the first question is, is there a legal authority through this mechanism or any other to modify the original conditions. Number two, you don't have to answer this right now. Number two, have you formed an opinion as to whether the proposed applications are exempt from CEQA? Both of those questions to me are spectacularly relevant to whether these applications should be granted. Chair Lane, I'm available to answer both of those questions right now. Okay, I, I read your lips and I think you said go ahead. So I'll start with the first question, which was- I did, I did say um, go ahead, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Is there a legal authority to modify the original conditional use permit? And my response to that is yes. However, the request before you is not a modification of the 1965, 1992, or any other conditional use permit. 
Um, Menlo School has a series of conditional use permits that has been authorized by this planning commission over a period of time. And as Ms. Costa Sanders previously explained in her uh, staff report, a conditional use permit allows the town of Atherton to consider special uses that might be desirable to the use of the town, but which are not allowed as a matter of right or considered permitted uses within the zoning code, as long as we have a public hearing and as long as we comply with the necessary findings in the Atherton Municipal Code. For our, for our purposes, there's two findings that any application for a conditional use permit uh, must meet. And both of those are uh, identified in your staff report. So again, the first question was, can we modify it? Even if the previous conditional use permit was before you, my answer would be yes. A conditional use permit is not written in stone. It confers a property interest to the applicant and its successors and assigns as long as they're complying with those, but it could be modified by mutual agreement of both parties. Um, what's before you is a temporary, it's a request for a, temp, a completely different, separate and apart um, request for a conditional use permit that allows temporary lights. The second question that you had was whether it, I had considered if this uh, application was exempt from CEQA. And my answer to that is yes, I have considered it. And my professional legal opinion is that it is exempt from CEQA. Um, for, uh, for several reasons. Number one, it falls within the statutory exemptions set forth in the CEQA guidelines. Those are identified specifically in the staff report and in the resolution that you've been asked to identify. But from a more practical perspective, this is an existing use. This is not a request for a brand new use or the exacerbation of something that would be permanent in nature. The school kids are already on campus. So there's no additional traffic. There's no additional trips. This is just a delay in pickup time for all intents and purposes. Additionally, the only exacerbation of an impact is uh, temporary light and noise. Because the noise um, has been tested, verified by Atherton Police Department to fall within the allowable limits of our code, there is no noise impact. And the negligible light impacts, which prefer, provide, as far as we know today, little to no uh, impacts on adjacent residents. I know that Ms. Disher will disagree with me um, later today, um, but, but the council, excuse me, the planning commission can decide that that because it's temporary and because CEQA really does focus temporary versus permanent impacts, there's not, an, there's not a, a demonstrable impact. That answers your question, but I'm happy to elaborate if you'd like me to. Perfect. That answers both my questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibrahimi. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibrahimi. Thank you very much. All right, great. So, so Than, anything else from your from your group before I open it up to the other members uh, or other uh, individuals interested in talking? There, unless there are other questions, we're happy to uh, happy to mute. We may come back to you depending on uh, what we uh, hear in the, in the next few minutes. It's fine. All right, I'll go ahead and uh, open up the uh, the public uh, hearing for anyone else. Uh, uh, Paul, I see your, your hand is raised. So I'll start with Mr. Getty. And we did get your, and uh, Paul, before you start, I want to be clear. Lisa, you want to highlight the uh, emails, that the mail that we were sent uh, prior to the meeting later today? Thank you. Um, we did receive several email correspondences that were provided directly to the planning commissioners prior to the meeting. One was from Paul and Jan Getty, Stephanie Descher, Stuart Rosenberg, and Jan McKenzie. Thank you. I want to make sure that, that, that all commissioners get the information. I, I printed them out and read them. I read them before I printed them out because they're printing so slow. But did everyone get, get them? I got them all, yes. I did too. All right, Nancy, you got them? Yes. All right, good. All right, Ms. Getty, you can go ahead. And, uh, we'll go next. Uh, I'm not hearing you for some reason. Are you, are you muted? Uh, Paul, I, Paul, I can't hear you. Jacob, Am I the me. only one? 
Jacob may need to unmute him. Unmute. When he's he's unmuted. He may need to change his microphone selection via Zoom. Yeah. Paul, you may, when you, when you uh, came in, you may not have clicked on use your computer for your, for your uh, micro, for the sound. We're, we can see your mouth moving, but we can't hear you. And I'm not the only one. Paul, uh, you're unmuted on our end, but we can't hear you at all. And it's not showing muted. So when you logged in, you may not have collected, uh, selected uh, using the internet for your microphone. Let's wait and see if he logs back in for a second. We could always just skip to another. Yeah, speaker. if he if he comes right back, I'll I'll go ahead and uh, I want to make sure that he that he uh, doesn't feel like he missed his turn. But uh, we can go to we can go to somebody else. I just want to make sure he didn't pop right back up. Here he comes. There he is. He's connecting his audio. Okay. okay, Paul, it looks like you now uh, are have the audio option, but you have to take yourself off mute. There you go. You're back on mute. There you go. Can we just skip to a different speaker? Yeah, I just don't just want skip to, to someone. He'll he'll jump on when he can. Yeah, he's he's pulling in right now. I, I I'm watching his I'm watching his audio. I just want to make sure that uh, he doesn't come back feeling like we skipped right over him. He is logging in. I can see that. Well, we're not going to skip him. I mean, we're I mean, we're not going to negate anything he has to say. We're just yeah, trying to use time wisely. Yeah, I know. All right. When again, uh, when can you, you hear me? Yes, Paul, there you are. All right. We can hear you now. Okay, guys. Uh, so just a procedural question. Last time we got together, we were limited to, I think, about three minutes to share comments from the neighbors. Uh, you know, when, when Dan started, he had six minutes, and the discussion then on the Q&A went about 30 oh, minutes. Oh, are we going to be limited in, in terms of the time we're going to have to uh, present inputs? Paul, we're going to be limited to, uh, to, to this evening. And I'm going to try to make sure everybody gets to be heard. So, and we have your we have your your uh, information. And so we're, we're looking to ha have you highlight whatever you want to highlight in what you sent to us already that we've read, or whatever other comments. And we'll try to get, we'll, we're going to make sure that you get heard. So don't worry about that. Just as a matter of fact, I've held up the meeting to make sure you could get back so that you didn't feel like you were being uh, uh, put to the end of the line. So. Go ahead and start. Okay, I, I just wanted to clear up a procedural question. I want to hold my comments pending uh, initial comments from Stephanie. Uh, uh, it, 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 um, hold your comments for initial. Uh, okay, so do you want someone else to speak instead of you then? I was only asking a procedural question. I was not prepared to deliver my comments. I want Stephanie to speak first. All right, great. So procedurally, I will try to make sure everybody gets heard completely, but I want to make sure that we just don't all ramble on. And well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Eric, this is Randy. Stephanie yeah. already spoke. She already made the staff presentation. Yeah. No, no, not, not, not your Stephanie, our Stephanie. Lisa, oh, oh, I have no Lisa. idea who you're talking about that. Okay. Yeah, Lisa made the presentation. Stephanie's not here tonight. I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry, Lisa. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Stephanie, all right. You want to... Well, why don't we just have Stephanie go then? Yeah. Stephanie, you want to go? You're on mute. Stephanie, if you're talking, you're on mute. Jake, are you is she on mute through us or through her? I see that she's on mute. Um, on mute. If she can unmute herself, she should be able to talk. I'm unable to unmute her. All right. Well, well Stephanie works that out. Who else would like to speak? For other people <laughs> online, I want to. I want to make sure everybody gets to be heard. Is there anyone else to speak besides Stephanie and Paul? Uh, 
It's very important that Stephanie go first. We talked earlier today, and she has some prepared remarks uh, that need to go ahead of ours. Well, then Stephanie, I need to get off mute and give them. Stephanie, are you there now? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Oh, great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say how impressed I am with the planning committee. I'm so impressed with your questions and evaluation of the evidence. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that I'm looking forward to your authentic findings. I really appreciated your questions. So let me just yeah. start. Um, Stephanie, for the record, go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Stephanie Disher, and I'm at 69 Alejandra next to Wonderlick Field. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the, uh, and the, I wanted to address, before I start, I wanted to address a couple things that people said. The, um, Dan said something like, we weren't going to hear the noise, like we haven't heard the noise. And I want to tell you that we enjoy the happy noise from Menlo so much. It's when Menlo's violating the noise ordinance and using the PA speaker and not paying attention to the ordinances and the police won't enforce them and the kids are speeding up and down and people's dogs are getting hit on the street. That's when we start to get upset. And so there's a planning committee member who couldn't understand why we're so angry now. And it's because we know that this isn't just, this is not just a request that's because of the pandemic. So right now, the residents are willing to say, if Menlo is not gonna ask for lights again, if this is it, if you just want them for the, the pandemic and then it's all over, go on record with this promise and the neighbors will agree right now to your temporary permission. All right. I don't think, will Menlo accept that? Yeah, we're, we're, we'll come back to them. Just go ahead and make your, okay. well, use the chatter back. we want to keep okay. the comments to the commission and then the commission will channel any questions back to the applicant. Okay, right. okay. Be because it's not, in, a, it's not a free, okay. it's not a free form of discussion in, in that sense. We want to make sure you, we hear any concerns you have. And I really do appreciate your openness and, and, uh, and coming, coming uh, tonight. So I want to make sure we hear any highlights of concerns you have specifically. And then I know that, uh, uh, Paul Getty has some things to say too, and we wanna hear from him. And then we wanna make sure that we get any questions back to the applicant as appropriate. Stephanie, so anything else you need to add? Let's do it. Oh, okay, okay, so so in truth, uh, we know that this is not, the, the reason that we're angry is because we know that, it, that the schools are moving toward permanent lights. I had looked at the football schedule and I saw that the week that these conditional permits would end, Menlo and Sacred Heart have a seven o'clock PM game scheduled the very, the very next weekend. So as soon as these permits are, are expired, they'll be asking for another one so that they can play that game that's on their schedule because it's a night game. Um, also, the, um, the facts that you hear from the residents tonight are very, very important because the town council granted special event permits after the residents presented really important facts, then the town gave them the wrong information. We, prevent, we presented information about the decibels that, that the lights would be giving off. We presented information about the law and the town attorney disagreed. And then, so then, then the permits were granted and it took a lot of time afterward and they ended up being voided because, because the residents were right. And when, after they talked, we couldn't rebut them. So. It, we spent a lot of time just trying to get the facts straight. So I appreciate this. I appreciate you listening and hearing us. Okay, the first thing that I wanna talk about is the conditional use permit. The uh, town attorney told you that, that a conditional permit is granted for a- Hello? Illegal. It's a Can you hear me? Hello? Are we doing are we doing a three out a three minute or what are we doing here? This just this thing just went three minutes to three minutes. I mean um so I believe Stephanie's public comment was interrupted for about a minute and so I um can reset the timer to allow for another minute for her public comment. Okay, okay so I I was under the impression that we were not going to be cut off because be, I thought that Paul okay. All right. If a, a conditional use permit is granted for a legal use because lights are not allowed from Menlo, that's not a legal use. You wouldn't be granting a conditional use permit for a legal use. It's an illegal use. The, the town made this agreement with Menlo because Menlo wanted to expand. And, they, and so, Men, so the town was trying to think, what can we do to encourage mutual, mutual respect on this border where, where we have a zone boundary? And they said, oh, well, we're not gonna 
allow lights, that's the very first thing we're not going to do. So now Menlo doesn't want to hold up their part of the bargain, but the town was being very proactive in avoiding nuisance suits and everything else. So it's very, it's something that's important to think about. Also, very quickly, I'm, I want to establish that the town, that the school doesn't need this. Um, how did they practice in November and December last year? If, if they didn't have lights and they practiced till, till six o'clock because it gets dark much earlier and going very quickly because I, I think I'm going to be cut off and I want to get to the CEQA argument, argument. The California Supreme Court has consistently held that CEQA must be interpreted to afford the fullest possible protection to the environment. So if you even think maybe it applies, it's very important to do a CEQA analysis and it's really not that hard. The town has listed two exemptions. The first is a, is a, is a class 23 exception. That is for public facilities like convention centers and racetracks. So a gated private school field that players pay high tuitions to use is not a public gathering and the first exemption absolutely doesn't apply. The second one is for an existing use that doesn't change at all or it's just negligently expanded. And so the key question is, what is a negligible expansion of use? So, so would it stay on, in this exemption or not? A negligible use is defined as stairways that are rebuilt with the same material. The statute, that, that same regulation itself gives an example of landscaping that doesn't include pesticide. <laughs> that doesn't need a CEQA, except um, that doesn't need a CEQA analysis, but if it has pesticide, it probably does. So here, I think you probably read what I wrote. You we're did. looking at, now we're not sure how many hours we're talking about, but I calculated 700 and it's 700 hours of diesel has quite a few, and it's, just, it's a dangerous situation for the children. It has cancer causing nitric oxide that's in the air. So I would, the first, the first thing I'd be worried about would be the students. The, and so when you know that those problems exist and you, and you don't, and you know that because these are not road vehicles, you, you know that they're not required to have modern, modern interventions that will stop, stop some of the fumes, then you need to start asking questions and they're required to do it. If you even think, even if you do fall into an existing use category, if you even think that maybe it might be dangerous, then you're, you're required to do an initial analysis. And the initial analysis, ha there will be facts and evidence, and that will tell you if you need to go further. But there were no facts presented by the town or by the school, so nobody has done it. Menlo Atherton tried to exempt them themselves from CEQA, and they the, the judge stopped them, and they weren't allowed to use their temporary lights until they did a CEQA analysis. So if Menlo Atherton was not exempt, then why why is why are Menlo and Sacred Heart exempt? I don't understand what the difference would be. All right, thank you. All right, well, uh, anything else? Uh, but yeah, I'd love to keep going if, if I'm going to be allowed to. I, I, I want you to make sure that uh, we're yeah. trying to make sure that- Can we, can we just, if, if we're going three minutes, <laughs> that was six, that was six there. Right. No, Eric granted it's more than three minutes, guys. Why three minutes when when Than and the rest of this group gets you know six minutes for an opening and three minutes of discussion? That's not fair. You're out of order. All right. So here's what we're gonna do. Stephanie, I need you to, to be as succinct as you possible you can in terms of highlighting whatever points you have, but not go into a long, long story about it so I can get everyone else who needs to talk to talk. And then okay. if we have more questions, we can ask you questions. Okay. Uh, I, need, I think all right. I think the okay, so I think the most important, the last, the most important argument is that these lights are required to be downlit. If these, the, there's a reason for the law. The law applies to everyone. If you make this ex exception, then you may as well take the law out because you can't ask everyone else to have downlit lights, but not the school. That's a, that's a law. That's not in their conditional use permit. When the lights are not shining down. I asked, the, I asked the town, well, how would you know if they're spilling onto other people's property? And they said, oh, well, the residents will have to take pictures and bring them to the town and show us. That's, that's not fair. You can't put that burden on the residents and ask them to, to enforce the law because you're reading it backward and everyone else, and you're not applying it fairly, which is a violation of equal protection. All right. And so also the police are not enforcing the law. I, I included two exhibits where Lisa Costa Sanders admitted it to me just this month 
And then the, the police chief admitted it to another neighbor a couple of years ago. They're not enforcing the law because they don't have the staff. So how can you ha how can you have light shining on, uh, onto other people's property? How can you have uncertain hours where we're going to practice till 6.15 or 6.30? I mean, who's going to stop them from practicing until 7? All right. Those are good points. All right. Uh, uh, are there any uh, uh, any questions of Stephanie? No. I do. I do have a question. Okay, Paul. Go ahead. Or Perry. Go ahead. Yeah, St Stephanie. Um, very direct question. How would the proposed lights being on for an hour and fifteen or hour and a half during the proposed period affect you personally or your household? Well, we, they did, okay, so they were going to shine right into my kitchen window while I ate dinner, and they were going to prevent phone conversations because they were so loud, but I live next to Wonderlick, and so the reason that they took the lights away from that field is because that field is illegal. So, right now. Stephanie, you faded out. Stephanie, the last part of your answer faded out. Are you there? High school. Hello? Yeah, you just faded out for a second. Go ahead and say the last but, part of but, it. Okay, so driving, just driving past it and seeing the lights, it's just, it's not relaxing. It's its not its not the residence that, that we moved to in 1978 when the school was, what, 400 people. And the town has let it grow and they haven't they haven't made requirements for landscaping and noise. And they, they, let, the, they, let, they let Wonderlick be built illegally. And all of the use is right in the corner up against our house. And it's completely unreasonable. And this is why the neighbors don't like Menlo anymore because the town is not is not working the way that they worked in 1965 to create respecting respecting relationships where everybody treats each other the right way. All right. All right. Perry, any other questions? That's all. Thank you. All right. Anyone else with questions? Not me. Okay, no. good. Then I'll go ahead and, and Paul, you you're up now, Paul. Yeah, thanks. So I, I, good, good meeting tonight, guys. I really appreciate the back and forth. You know, I, I would make sure that my comments are read into the record as I requested. I would only add the following. My understanding is that the, the testing that was done, which has been alluded to three or four times this evening, was done on one light. One light. Is that correct? We'll find out in a minute. I don't know. Yet. That's, that's okay. It is one light. I saw one light out on the field. If there are now six lights, I think it's reasonable to assume that six times the amount of noise or some algorithm related to that is going to be really what we're going to be facing. And six times the amount of diesel emission is what we're going to be facing. And that has not been tested. I've not seen six lights out on the, on the field. So when you say that it's been tested and approved and the police were there, I take, I take significant exception to that. That was not done. You did not put six lights on the field. You did not measure the noise. All right. All right. Go ahead. Keep, keep, on, keep in mind, they're speaking to the commission, all right? So just, we're all trying to be neighbors here and try to do the right thing. So just let's keep it as neighborly as we can. Right? Well, I'm trying to keep it neighborly, guys, but this is very confrontational and we're cut down to limited times. I appreciate you giving us more time, but you did not provide the kind of testing of the environment that you're proposing. All right. And I'll leave it at that. And you have my other comments written into the record, I presume, and, and I'll leave it at that. All right, and your, uh, what I have here is please confirm you see the comments and read them in the record tonight's hearing. Uh, we wish to strenuously object to the granting of the lights at Carton Fields as recently proposed. Uh, the donation of the land at Carton uh, Fields was conditional, uh, was conditioned upon explicit uh, unambiguous, uh, un, uh, unambiguous conditions, which include there shall be no illumination, nor shall there be any activity hereon between sunset and sunrise, period. And number two, it is highly improper and inconsistent to extend uh, what is characterized as a one-time use of the lights on uh, for the last homecoming in the current request. If allowed, it, it, it can be expected that the further request for lights will be made in violation of, of the CUP. Number three, the town ordinance limits the use of lights uh, to downlighting only. The light that uh, was uh, been placed on Carton does not produce downlighting, downlighting and schools have failed to offer proof that the proposed lights do not violate downlight, downlighting ordinance. Uh, there's And number four is there's no proof uh, submitted that the multiple generators used for the proposed lights so will not produce sound levels beyond the permitted or the diesel emissions with, uh, with will be uh, within the uh, 
state standards. I went ahead and changed the word there. It said with the within state, the city and state standards. The request of permission should not be considered uh, without adequate proof that no violations uh, will be made. Number five, the donation of the field was conditioned on the ability of the city to enforce the provisions of the CUP. The adequate provisions of the driveway facilities and parkings together with sufficient agreements to enforce the carrying out of, of such permits and, and th this permits exists. Uh, Lisa indicates the city only enforced persons uh, and suggested the city is incapable of enforcing violations. This is consistent with the requirements of the CUP. Number six, we also object to the very unfair process of limiting discussion and comments by neighbors to interest uh, parties for only three minutes. And the city has discretion to allow adequate time or, uh, refusing to do so reflects unfair and improper bias towards the neighbors uh, and uh, retain our rights to appeal any decision uh, which we do not, uh, which we believe is not consistent with the current ordinances and SEUP. Hopefully, we demonstrated that last point uh, wasn't a factor. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Much appreciated. Okay, great. Um, anyone else here to speak on the item? I see someone on an iPhone that I don't see. Yeah, yeah, it's Mickey King. Mickey, go ahead. Uh, Mickey, go ahead. You're on mute. Uh, oh, you're on your. You're probably on voice on your on your iPhone and mute on your on your monitor. Go ahead. Mickey King, you're up. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay, I, I take less than one minute. Um, uh, Mickey, uh, go, ahead, go ahead and introduce yourself officially for the record. Yeah, Mickey King at uh, 69 Alejandro, Jason to Wonderlick. Okay. I bought this house in 1977, and uh, I did it uh, because of the Atherton rural, uh, beautiful community we have in the trees, and it reminded me of my home in Michigan, frankly. And uh, uh, Menlo School at the time was a, a small boys' school. Menlo College was a two 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 year college, and both have grown enormously. Uh, the CU the uh, CUP that was signed in 1965. Uh, the first thing on that whole document is no illumination. I mean that was the the very first thing, and uh, uh, it is obviously. Uh, going to be changed or it, it, it's uh, unfortunate that uh, people think they can just change things when we bought in not such a cheap neighborhood <laughs> to, yeah. to uh, protect these homes. Uh, the, uh, the last thing I, I wanted to comment on, uh, because I think uh, Stephanie and Paul have said most of what I wanted to say, the unfortunate uh, to hold this meeting when several neighbors are can't attend, they're not here. It's a holiday week. The town is closed, and we asked that it be uh, put on to a later date, and that was ignored or not not granted. But it's just uh, I think it's very unfortunate to hold this on Monday after Christmas. Thank you. I am done. All right, Mickey. Thank you very much, and thank you for waiting to, to be heard. Um, and uh, uh, let's see. Anyone else to speak? Uh, ready to speak? Yes. Let's see. David, David Disher, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, uh, make your make yeah. your comments. David, you're cutting. In, David, you're cutting. In, in, you that. David, David, you're cutting in and out. So try one more time or get close to your mic. All right. Yeah, sounds like you're on VoIP or something in there. David, you're... Put a headset in. Yeah, David, you're you're. Uh, we hear one one word and then you fade out, and then about twenty seconds later, another word comes up. I hope that's better. That's much better. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm lucky to be the husband of Stephanie, so uh, let me just bring a few thoughts up. Uh, as I'm and sure Mona. And go ahead and reintroduce yourself for the record. Da Just David Disher, I'm sorry. All right, good. As I'm sure Mona will explain, your decisions have to be substantiated by facts put before you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the facts substantiate granting this permit. Uh, I will address two issues that I see. One is uh, the illumination, and the second is the noise. Uh, essentially, the illumination says from Menlo, very little spillover from these non-downlit lights. Well, what does that mean? And is very little times six okay? 
There has been absolutely nothing put before you that in, has any empirical analysis of that statement. Nothing about the compounding effect of six law, lights, nothing from staff that they did to validate this statement. Merely saying it's professional opinion is not detrimental to residents is factually unsupported. Granting the request with the absence of facts about the illumination and the spillover to the residents is simply unlawfully arbitrary and capricious. Now let's talk about the noise. One generator was tested, not four, not three, not five, not even six, which they've put on the record is what they want. And actually it's not even limited to six. It could be eight, 10 or 12, we don't know. Obviously six people yelling is louder than one person. Six cars going by is louder than one. And on top of that, it's the noise of practice. Staff again provides zero facts to show that the real proposal of six generators meets the requirements of the town's laws. Why is it not Menlo's burden to show compliance? Why is Menlo allowed to have the police spend their valuable time helping Menlo. The facts on the noise that has been presented by staff do not allow the Planning Commission to approve any more than one generator and zero because there's no facts supporting the fact that there will be unacceptable spillover into the neighbor's yards. The Planning Commission cannot approve this based on the facts it's been presented because such a decision will be arbitrary and capricious. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any questions of David? Not from here. All right. Yeah. All right, anyone else uh, uh, up next? I see a JH, I see an iPhone, and I see uh, a telephone. Anyone else? OK, I'm going to close the public hearing on, on this item. Um, and bring it back to, to the commission for discussion and action uh, as appropriate. All right. Anyone, anyone want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Oh, who's uh, that? Randy, is that you? Perry. Okay, Perry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, what about this issue about uh, how many generators was tested? What, what's up with that? Certainly. Um, so we don't require there to be proof of compliance prior to submitting an application. Um, generally, that would be verified once it's in operation, the town would verify it. Um, so we didn't require Menlo School to have a test light up. They chose to do that on their own. Um, they did have one light present, and um, I was informed that it would be there. And so I asked the police department to go do an independent um, sound testing so that I would have that information available to provide to the commission. Um, we did not require that beforehand. So um, as indicated, once if, if approved, once all the lights are present, we would do a follow-up inspection to verify that it complies with the town's noise ordinance. If it doesn't, they would need to modify the lights or the generator to ensure compliance. And if they cannot do so, then it would not be able to be in operation. All right. well, I've got a follow up on that one then, Perry. Is that all right? Yes. Uh, so the question I have then is, is the, the since there's an approval period already, what the dates are January 4th to what? The January 4th to the... Yes, if they had those lights up during that initial um, approval period, January, let's see. 4th through January 15th, we could verify it at that time if they were installed. All right, and we would be testing, we'd be looking at the light impact during that, uh, uh, that time. The, um, we'd be looking at the noise impact. The, the town does not have light regulations contained within its PFS zoning district. So we're focused on the noise regulations. All right. Uh, okay, then I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to talk about that in a minute then. Um, any any other any other comments? Perry, did you have more? I just wanted to piggyback on your question. So go ahead, Perry, if you have any more. No, thank you. 
Uh, Eric, I'd just like to ask Mona again to, um, and, and she went over this earlier with Perry, but just to restate the uh, issues regarding the 1965 CPU and uh, how this would supersede that uh, regulation on uh, illumination and then uh, the CEQA question again. Yes, Commissioner Tonelli, I can respond to both of those questions. So what you are being asked today is not to approve a conditional use permit that supersedes prior permits. You are being asked to approve a temporary conditional use permit that allows temporarily um, the use of Carton Field for outdoor recreational football uses for a certain period of time. So this is a completely separate and distinct use from the other conditional use permits. We could have brought the 1965 permit and asked that that be modified, but it was staff's judgment that this is limited duration and to leave that general broad application of no lights alone and view this on a temporary use basis. Um, as to the CEQA exemption, staff has prepared a notice of exemption which is uh, typical for these types of project, contrary to the public comment that was provided. An analysis was in fact conducted. Um, there was a comment that there's no facts to support a determination by the Planning Commission, but that's erroneous. Um, and I present the following facts for the Planning Commission's consideration in support of that exemption, that this is an existing use of temporary nature with negligible uh, impacts. Number one, there's no new trips. You're talking about existing students already on campus. You're not looking at additional trips, parents dropping kids off. Um, so also ex existing students, you're not opening this up to the public for more uses or um, a bigger enrollment. Um, number three, noise is required to be within the thresholds provided by the municipal code. That is also set forth as one of the um, conditions, it's condition number three of the conditional use permit. They must comply with that. If they don't comply with that, the town may revoke the conditional use permit. Um, and CEQA allows exemptions from these types of uses because they're temporary, because they're negligible. So um, I submit those facts for the Planning Commission's determination. This is a discretionary um, decision that you are making. So you have the ability to balance the facts um, and you have the ability to balance what you believe the public benefit is um, as compared to the potential uh, temporary impacts. Okay, thanks for readdressing that, but uh, just for my clarification. Uh, Eric also had a couple of questions again for uh, uh, Mr. Healy and uh, Mr. Corbin too, if I can. All right, then I'll have to open the public hearing uh, uh, one more time to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll open the public hearing for those for those questions, and then. Uh, yeah. So for either of you or both, uh, just to again make sure that I'm clear on this, you you were talking about LED lights down firing LED lights. Is that correct? Is that was what was discussed or what you mentioned? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then the other one uh, is there seems to be a lot of uh, discussion here about uh, six generators. And I, I'm a huge high school football fan, full disclosure. Been to a number of games where they've had temporary lights. Uh, very familiar with the process. But I've seen uh, four standards used even during games. Is it, is a possibility that we could limit the usage of lights down to four standards? How would that affect you? So these, the, the lights you're talking about for a game, th those are like standards go up 50 feet or so. And those okay. lights are so much more powerful than what we're talking about. Right. Just, you know, they're, they're, they go up 20 feet. They, the one we tested, it barely went across half field. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to be, you know, with, even with these lights, we're not going to be able to throw balls in the air or punt. Uh, once the ball gets up 20 feet, it's going to be disappear. So we're going to have to change all our drills to be um, like, I mean, drills as opposed to li live balls um, up in the air because they'll mm -hmm. be lost in the darkness. These aren't nowhere near lights that are done for games. These are, these are when you see on, on construction on, on the freeways, 
those little lights, the standards that are there, that's what these mm -hmm. are. So, this so you're looking at what, 10 feet tall or 15 feet high or? 20. 20 feet high? Yeah. So much lower than anything you'd see Correct. at a game or obviously with any permanent light setup. Right. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else, Paul? No, that's it for now. Till we get rolling here. All right. Randy or Nancy? No, I'm just listening. I you got my opinion a few minutes ago, and I uh, I have no further questions or comments. Eric, are you looking for us to ask questions, or are you as asking for us well, to make statements? Yeah, I, I I would say I want to make sure that we had any questions answered. I, we'll go, I'm going to officially close the public hearing uh, so that we don't thanks, know, Eric. If we are closed on public hearing. Actually, I'm ready for any comments, uh, uh, comments of the commissioners. I just want to make sure we had uh, any questions answered uh, first. So, Randy or Nancy, any questions or comments? And I'm ready for comments. Um, this is Randy. I'm happy to make a comment. So, so one, I, I, I understand from the neighbors. I've been on planning commission. I was on general plan. I've been active in the town for many, many years. And I know it's hard living next to a school. I know it is. I mean, we saw it all with, with Menlo Atherton and their new performing arts center years ago. You know, all the schools have this, this adjacency issue and having been on planning commission for a long time, I also know that, that before then that there was some things that were happening there that the, the community outreach, et cetera, weren't great. And that the neighbors felt um, that, that they weren't being listened to. I get it. If you go back uh, for all you guys, Paul, Mickey, David, Stephanie, you will hear me say specifically in every single meeting, have you talked to your neighbors? How do they feel? Where, where are they on this? Um, have you done everything you can to, to mitigate and minimize whatever the impacts are? That's just, that's just how I believe. It's a good neighbor, it's fencing, et cetera. So I know there's a lot of strong feelings and there's a lot of feelings here. I, I heard it again tonight about this becoming, you know, once they become a temporary thing, they're become, gonna become a permanent thing. I, I, I can't speak to that. I'm not, you know, from a Menlo standpoint, they've committed that that's not where they are. From a planning commission standpoint, we have to go off the facts. I've read through everything. I'm very comfortable with, with what's there. It's a, come on, for crying out loud, it's a pandemic. We've got kids that need to be in school. We're all feeling this isolation now. Look at us all on a screen rather than being together. So from my standpoint, these are 20 foot standards. Uh, I, Paul said it best earlier, Paul Tonelli said it, the, the, the sunset times at that time of year are 519 in the evening until 613 in the evening. So technically, the closer it gets to March 12th, the less they're even going to need lights. And from my standpoint, I look at it and think, gosh, as a community, I know it's no fun living next to a school. I get it. And I know there's hard feelings, but on the other hand, I think they've presented this as to what it is. It's a limited time frame. Uh, we have the, the town attorney who's done her best to make sure from a CEQA standpoint, what we all as planning commissioners rely on is the CEQA portion has been met. So from my standpoint, I do not have a problem with the application as it is. All right. All right. Any, uh, anyone else ready for comment? Uh, yeah, just to finish up, Eric, um, I've, I've thought a lot about this and, and uh, I'm fairly confident this is a completely different situation as Randy just addressed with uh, what's going on uh, nationwide and, and internationally. So uh, I have so many friends and family with kids in grammar school and high school and I hear on a nearly daily basis about uh, what's going on with the kids trying to get out and the school, the homeschooling and things like that. And I'm very sympathetic to that. A, a couple of things have me leaning uh, toward the lights on this. Number one is uh, the separation from the football field to Brittany Meadows. I know there's still some adjacency going on with uh, uh, Alejandra, but uh, I think the 100 plus yards or so from the football field down to Brittany Meadows uh, especially with only 20 foot standards is a consideration uh, in, in favor of the lights. Um, I do trust Menlo to do whatever it takes to mitigate uh, what's going on with the light situation. Uh, I put a lot of stock in what Randy mentioned with the calendar. And uh, even though the, uh, uh, the CUP is saying 345 to 615, I do think realistically we're looking at 
445 to uh, 615. And that's going to be even condensed as we get toward the middle of March. Uh, and I think those are all, um, you know, very considerable mitigating factors. So I, I think when you consider the uh, outstanding irregularity of the situation with what's going on, uh, the needs to, for the kids to get out and socialize and live some sort of semblance of a normal high school life when it's already been interrupted for nine months is a huge consideration. And, uh, and again, the 20 foot standards, the separation, uh, I, I think, and, and the limited hours, which are just about half of what's being asked for in the CUP uh, are considerations that uh, we need to look at. Thank you. Yeah, I can go ahead, Perry, or you can go ahead, go or Nancy. I, I've got some thoughts on this that I think we have a unique situation, but go ahead. Anyone else would like to speak? This is Nancy. I'll just say again that uh, I find the school has always tried to be a good neighbor here in Atherton in a, another town nearby. We once lived right across from a school. We knew darn well when we moved in, we were across from a school and we didn't let it bother us. And I don't think these neighbors should either. They knew they were moving next to a school and now the days are getting longer. It, to me, it's just a, a non-problem. So that's all I have to say. Barry, you wanna go or you want me to go? Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, be brief here. So I, I want uh, all the neighbors to know that I, I read their written submissions very carefully and listen to everything they, they said very carefully. Uh, and I, I agree with uh, Paul and Randy and Nancy and their sentiments. And I, I would like to thank uh, the neighbors for their input, which is valuable and important, but in the balancing that's required here, uh, I, I think that the, the weights uh, are in favor of uh, granting the application. I, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm very comfortable with the leadership of the schools that run the run it right procedures. Um, there there is a window here I think that is unique in that we do have we already have an approval of two weeks, uh, which for me at least makes the possibility of of coming uh, looking at this during those two weeks at the end of those two weeks to see what the real impact is so that. You know, we all have theories about the, what the reality would be. And I think uh, the idea that, uh, first of all, there may not be a season. So it may not, uh, it, by, by the middle of January or early January, we might not, we might not have an issue at all. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Um, the, uh, the uh, I think there needs to be a tightening up of the clarification of what days we're actually talking about. And I think that gets clear in January also. The other thing that gets clearer in January is what the real impact is of six machines going at the same time, and also how the lights are pointed. Like, can they be pointed towards the field but away from all the of all the families, or slightly tilted, tilted towards back towards the school, and still light the field? So I'm I'm looking at that two week period as a possibility for us to do a do a temperature check on the reality of it, uh, and then. And then we, this was a this was a meeting that we added. Uh, I wouldn't have a problem with adding a meeting, you know, late, uh, you know, that between the two weeks to say, okay, what is the reality? How is the noise really? How how do the lights impact? What uh, what is the reality of the usage? What does the real schedule look like now that we see more? And that gives us time to to uh, you know solve for these these three aspects of it, which is I want to make sure that the Constantly, we want to make sure that the neighborhood knows that we're that we're taking that in consideration. But I also want to make sure the kids get an opportunity to have a good education as good as they can these days. And of all the of all the the, the schools that uh, leadership that we have around that field, this is the one leadership that I that I feel comfortable with doing the right thing. So I I can either go with it now or I can actually go with it with the idea of looking at it in a special meeting in January. So we have more information, um, but I'll 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 listen to the rest of the commissioners on that. It seems to me I leave this in this one case 
uh, in particular, we have a unique opportunity to evaluate the real impact. Well, wait a minute, Eric, are you saying not to make a decision on it tonight or that you want to leave this open, make a decision tonight and, and leave this open for down the road, which I think is a really dangerous precedent to set as a planning commission? Well, I, I'm not, I'm looking for, uh, I would look at either making a decision tonight one way or the other, or continuing this conversation to the to the, sec to the second week in January when we have information about the real impact of the lights and whether or not the lights are even needed because there's no, there's no, uh, there's, there's no uh, season. Because, uh, you know, if we go through all this and then there's no season, it's just like, okay, why do we go through all this? And if we go through this and find out that six, six generators do create a lot more noise than everybody thought, um, then we'll be, and then we're in a situation of trying to rescind a, uh, uh, an agreement rather than approving it with with certain clarifications. So, um, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I understand why why the, the school would want clarity. And I understand, I, I totally understand that. But we're not getting clarity. We're not getting clarity about what the schedule is going to be. We're not getting clarity about what the uh, what the actual noise is. And we've got a perfect opportunity because we had an approval already. So there's two weeks where we're going to get an absolute test. And, and if we find that that is the noise is louder than everybody thought, or the lights are much better than everybody thought, or the time required is much less than people thought, um, then that will make it uh, uh, what I consider to be a, an even more thoughtful conversation than we have right now. All right, Mona has her hands up. So I got any legal advice. Um, sure, Lane, I do wanna make sure that the commission is aware that we do have clarity on the request by Menlo School, um, which is reflected in condition one of the conditional use permit as to the use. It specifically says that the use of Carton Field would be for outdoor recreation activities from the period of January 19th through March 12th during the hours of 3.45 until 6.15 and only Mondays through Fridays. So the commission could decide that it wishes to refine that further, but I don't want the record to reflect I don't have clarity on the timing and the dates of the request because it is in fact in there. The second point that I wanted to make is that condition uh, two requires lighting to be directed towards the field and condition three requires that the generators associated with that lighting comply with the town's noise ordinance. So that could mean 10 generators, that could mean one. Um, the number is not relevant. What's relevant is whether the uh, 55 decibel maximum threshold could be accomplished. And again, the ability for Menlo School to be able to use the conditional use permit is predicated and, and specifically conditioned on their compliance with these um, conditions of approval. So if the planning commission were to approve this and during the two week special event permit, um, we determine that noise exceeds the maximum thresholds, then they would be prohibited from being able to use this conditional use permit as well. Yes, and the clarity I was talking about was not about the use. The clarity was about the specific dates of when a game would be, that Friday practice wouldn't be required. There's a one week close uh, period that's not highlighted in this period of time uh, specifically. So that was the that was the detail that I was, uh, I was referring to, but I understand what you're talking and about. One, and one response to that is um, at the planning commission's discretion, we could add a clause that says that such use only when school is actually in session and not to exceed, for example, 33 days during the entire period. I mean, that that's for you all to decide, but we could add further language if you would like. Great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to make a motion on this uh, and, and then add, and if I know we don't wanna get into too much discussion about it, but I, 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 I understand everybody's concern. I understand, Eric, that you feel like this is a little loosey goosey on the way that it is, but if, if I, I'd be comfortable making the motion, and if people are comfortable that we put limitations on that it's 33 days, that it's not to be you, that the lights are not to be on, uh, and on the days that there isn't school, I, I'm fine with that. And then I think it's just a matter of the town. I, I don't want to get into the the part here where we're actually managing 
this for Memo. That's not, or, you know, or any other school or any entity. We all know that. This is the, our job is just to interpret what's in front of us at this time, right. and that's where I am. I'm comfortable with that. And and with those and those and those specific uh, uh, comments that uh, Mona made uh, pulled in would make me feel much more comfortable. Okay, I'm going to make a motion then. Uh, I move. I move approval of resolution number 2020. I don't know what the number is, this dash, whatever it is, which grants the conditional use permit to allow temporary use of athletic fields for outdoor recreation activities with temporary lights from January 19th, 2021 through March 12th, 2021 from the hours of 3.45 p.m. until 6.15 p.m. Monday through Friday at Carton Football Field for Menlo School, the 50 Valparaiso Avenue, and finds that this CUP is exempt from CEQA. Mona, should I add in some language or would you like to saying that the limitation is at 33 days, school days only, and, or yeah, school days only, and that if there isn't a school day or if it's a professional day, as Stan mentioned earlier for the school, that, that, that the, the field will, should not be used at that time frame with lights on. Yes, we can add a clause to the end of condition one that states that and only on days in which school is actually in session. Okay, great. And the and the resolution number is, is the 2020 hyphen. The hyphen goes to the date that's uh, it's approved. Is that is that why there's a no uh, information after the hyphen in the in the motion? Um, it would be number one. This is the first resolution of the okay. year, so I don't put the number until you're ready to act upon it. All right, good. So so that clarifies that. I want to make sure on the for the record that was clarified. All right, do we have a motion? And a second, who's, who's making the second? I'll second, this is Nancy. Uh, okay, Nancy, you're, you're, you're second. And Paul raised his hand, but Nancy got the voice first. <laughs> so I'll go ahead, Randy makes a motion and, and uh, Nancy seconds. Uh, any comments before we make, uh, do we take the roll call? No questions. Just like to thank Mona for the uh, legal advice and uh, the interpretation and uh, the explanations that you provided tonight. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone who showed up and talked and uh, was was very interested in this, uh, doing the right thing here. Yes. And uh, uh, I, I know Menlo School is going to do the right thing too. Lisa, can I have their roll call, please? Thank you. Commissioner Narancic? Yes. Commissioner Lerner? Yes. Commissioner Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Tonelli? Yes. Chair Lane? Yes. All right, then, uh, and then would you clarify what the next steps, if someone wants to make the next steps, uh, Lisa? Uh, yes, there's a 10-day appeal period. Should anyone wish to appeal the decision of the Planning Commission, you can contact myself or the city clerk and file the appropriate appeal fee and um, paperwork. Thank you. All right, all right, Stan and crew, uh, Earl, make sure you do the right things, please. Yeah. and stay in communication with everybody. Thank you, commissioners. All right, All right. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Uh, thank next you. Item. Everybody, neighbors. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, item 4B, conditional youth person, uh, permit for Sacred Heart Schools at 150 Valparaiso. We'll go through the same procedure on this for those of you who might have dialed in after I started the meeting. The procedures that we use on the, on the meeting is to go ahead and hear an overview of, of the item from staff. And then the commission asks staff questions as appropriate. And uh, Mona, you want to say something legally before I go through the process? Yes, Commissioner Lane, before we actually get into the staff report, I would ask it, that all planning commissioners um, discuss if they have any conflicts of interest that would recuse them from participating. If they do, they should still state that on the record and um, come off of the Zoom call, please. All right, does anyone have a conflict or let's, and let's do it this, this way. Would each of us say yes or no to a conflict? Uh, I'll uh, leave. No. I'll, go ahead, Paul. No conflict, Paul? No. Randy? Yes. You have this a conflict then? This is Randy, I do. I'm on, I'm on a, uh, our, all of our kids went through St. Joe's Sacred Heart and I am on, uh, still on a buildings and ground committee there. And I just, I feel the best thing for me would be to recuse myself from this. I just think it's the right thing for the town. I think it's the right thing for the school and obviously my, my duties on the planning commission. All right, Randy, thank you. 
So at this point, Mona, he would he would leave the meeting. Is that correct? Or at least discontinue? I'm going to leave it. I am going to leave it. Yeah. All right. You're not going to come yes, back. Thank you. Or I'm happy to come back. I'm happy to come back if anyone wants to text me or whatever. I just don't want to be. I, I want to make make this really clean. All right. So can he go on mute and take himself off camera or not? All right. He's he's just gonna cut out. We'll we'll text him back if he wants to come in. Yeah. All right. Then uh, uh, Nancy, any conflict on this one? No, I don't. Okay, so it's Paul, Nancy, and Eric, and and uh, and uh, that's that's the group on this. There's four of us. So uh, let me go through the procedure from this point. Uh, Mona, is that all we need to cover before I go over the procedures in the in the hearing? Yes, thank you. We've already gone through the ex parte communications. All right. all right. So the. Uh, um, uh, item 4B, uh, the procedure that we use on all of our, our items is we go through an overview from staff, and then the commission asks questions of staff, then we open up the public uh, hearing section, we hear from the applicant first, and then we hear from anyone else who'd like to speak on the topic, and then we bring it back to the commission for discussion and action as appropriate. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Lisa to give us the overview. Thank you. I'm going to present Sacred Heart's request for a conditional use permit. Next slide. Sacred Heart Schools is located at 150 Valparaiso. The campus is bound by Emily Avenue, Elena Avenue, Park Lane, and Valparaiso Avenue. And the school is located within the public facilities and school zoning district. Sacred Heart Schools requests a special event permit to allow temporary lights to accommodate athletic activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this request is different from Menlo's as Sacred Heart's request is not tied to a specific sport or athletic team, but rather general recreational activities for its students. Um, Sacred Heart requests that the lights be allowed from January 19th through March 12th on weekdays only, and that the lights be permitted up to 7 p.m. in the early evening and be located at Palatella Field and Dollinger Fields. This is the next slide shows a map of Sacred Heart School with Valparaiso and Palatella Field at the bottom of the screen and Dollinger Soccer Field adjacent to Park Lane located at the top of the screen. A church and single family homes are located in Menlo, Car and Menlo Park across from Palatella Field and single family homes along Park Lane are located across Dollinger Field. Next. The conditional use permit request is limited to temporary lights for a limited duration due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The school is required to comply with any county and state COVID-19 regulations for the activities that will occur on the field, and any other town regulations remain in effect, including compliance with the town's noise ordinance. The school sent a letter to neighbors informing them of the proposed project, and the town mailed notice of this public hearing to all property owners within 500 feet as well as publish the notice in the Almanac on December 18th. Um, here's the motion. Should you choose to make it, I'd be happy to try to answer any of your questions. That concludes staff's presentation. All right. Any questions of staff? Um, I may, I'll ask this question of the applicant also. Lisa, was there any given, uh, reason given for the late, uh, the seven o'clock time? Um, I'll have the applicant respond to why they've requested the hours. Okay, great. Thank All you. Right. And uh, with that, then, uh, any any question, other questions of staff at all before I open up public hearing? No. All right. No. Go ahead and open, open up the public uh, comment, and we'll start with the applicant. Who's going to speak? Mike, Michael, are you going to speak? It'll be Mr. Dioli, okay. our director of schools. All right. Uh, Richard, you're, you're on mute. I'm right now. Good evening. I'm Rich Dioli, Director of Schools, and along with me is Mike Dreyer, our Director of Operations. And as I speak to you tonight, he may be able to fill in a couple of the blanks that may be on your mind as well. This opportunity is just not about lights on a field or athletics and is not about Sacred Heart Schools. Now, the opportunity is for us to support the community by providing a space for young people to have a safe outdoor socialization, physical activity, dexterity through co-curricular offerings. At the end, we must focus on the whole child to provide way and provide ways to ensure they have healthy choices for mind and body. During the summer and into the fall, we were able to offer co-curricular activities outdoors 
after our online school day. We had over 300 students come onto our campus, switching off Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. With the winter days being so short, this outlet is not available. We simply request the opportunity to extend the day to help our efforts to develop the whole child. Our school day does end between 3.30 and quarter to four, depending on the given day. Our formal request is to place temporary field lighting on two of our fields, the football field and the Palatella and adjacent to the Valparaiso Avenue. And the second one is our soccer field, the Dollinger adjacent to Park Lane. It'd be Monday through Friday, 4.30 to 7 p.m. from January 19th to March the 12th with no need for lights during the week we are not in school, February 15th through the 19th. Again, if we do have games on a Friday, we would not have old practices. And if we have an in-service day, we would not have um, practices on those days as well. Mike, anything else you would want to mention? I can address the, the questions when the council is ready um, about the, the timing and why we're seeking what we're seeking. You're on mute, Eric. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead then, and go uh, go through the overview of that. Why the times and what this? Uh, so, with the comments about uh, holidays <clears throat> and other days, how many days are we actually talking about here? Again, you know, I I actually didn't do the math. I assume it's going to be the same 33 days. Uh, Menlo had led the way and um, explained that they weren't going to have the lights on during the holiday week, which is the same week that we are off and we don't plan on doing it that week either. So I see that our, our time should be um, the same. Okay. As far as the, the time for 7 p.m., we're not just running football drills um, on our fields. We have lacrosse. Uh, we have soccer, we have strength and conditioning, we have cross country, we have spin classes, we have done, as as Mr. Dioli had explained, we have done numerous co-curricular activities. And what we're trying to do is providing the, to provide these outlets for the children to have a safe harbor for an outdoor activity that allows them to socialize in a way that they haven't been able to do for nine months. And they're also able to use their, their physical um, positioning to, to gain some mental health. It, some of these kids don't even know they need it. It's just one of those things that we're looking for to be able to offer them. One of the things that, that Mr. Dioli had explained is that we did other co-curricular activities, which we cannot do now because we're, we run out of light and we need to do everything outdoors. But to give you an idea, we did individual woodworking, we did robotics, engineering, physics, dance, faux painting, spin, um, sustainable agriculture, tai chi, ping pong, the list actually goes on because we have upwards of 1200 students. We have to cycle them through, which is why we're asking for the 7 p.m. so that we can um, have a chance to cycle multiple uh, offerings through, which is what we did during the summer and fall. We would start a program, run it an hour, and then we would clean in between and then bring in a new program. And so that's why we looked at it in this fashion. How many students are we talking about? So right now, our estimate is that we will be upwards of 600 students. Um, it just depends on how many um, will take advantage of it. During the summer, we had six, uh, 365. And um, now that things have, have carried on, some of the sports programs want to have their teams do team building activities. They don't have the ability to actually play the games. So they do strength, conditioning, and drills. And how are the fields normally used during this period of time? The fields are used during the day for physical um, education. And then uh, if it were the afternoon portion, it would be practice for the various sports. 
right now with the way the sports were realigned through the um, CIF, each team didn't know when they were going to actually start. And so they had to try to figure out a way to have their, their players be in condition so that they wouldn't injure themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's our primary reason is, is to get them ready for this, but to also offer this outlet. So, so I guess what I was asking specifically is in a normal year, how would this field be used? Are you talking about a specific time of day or? No, I'm talking about this time of year. We get, the lights are being asked for because it's dark and you've got more programs out there. On a normal year, how late would this field be used and who would be using it? So on a normal year, the, the field would be, well, football would actually have ended in a normal year right now, so um, with the exception of playoffs. It would be boys and girls soccer teams that would be using the fields. Okay. At right at this moment. All right, and then and the difference now is that more programs have to be put out outside because they're not allowed to be inside. Yes. So how many? So how many individual programs are we talking about? Just the number? Is it twenty or ten or? Right now, it's minimum of five and probably a maximum of ten. Okay. All right. Anything else then? Any other questions? Paul, you're on mute, Paul. I know it's easy to fall into. I know it's hard for me to be quiet. And then when I'm quiet, it's really hard for me to be up loud. I'm, I'm acting my age with technology. Um, so the five days off that you're talking about, is that, uh, is that the week of President's Day? Correct. Yes. Okay, so by my math, it looks like uh, 39 days less those five uh, and then any in-service days. So 34 minus any in-service days that you may have uh, is what it looks like looking at the calendar. So uh, again, where Menlo was talking about the football field at Carton Field for their football team and not knowing what the CIF is going to do, how would that affect the lighting at Palatella Field? So as I explained earlier, it's not just for football. So right. we would use it for other activities. For example, right now on Pelotella Field, we have spin bikes gotcha. that we've had um, underneath tarps and so forth. And then we've run dance teams spread out across the football field. Okay. So it's definitely used for more than just football. And are we talking the same kind of lights that were defined in the Menlo case? with the shorter standards and the down firing LEDs? So they are LEDs, but no, they are not the short uh, standard. They are the standard 50 foot lights that are for uh, sports activity. And one of the reasons why um, we looked at this is because lacrosse would be very dangerous to do at low light levels. And so we wanted to make sure that we provided the maximum safety for players out on the field and uh, those that are around the track. Because when lacrosse is uh, in practice, we put nets around the field and we have some of the nuns that actually walk out on the track. And then we also have cross country. So it's, it's a safety issue. Right. And how many standards are we looking at for each field? So for the football field, it will be five standards. And for the soccer field, it will be four. And again, these are LED directional lights that will go directly down onto the field. Okay. This is different than lights that we've had in the past. And we've never had a problem with the lights in the past bleeding out into the neighborhood because of the brush that we have around the football field. And, and these are diesel driven also? They were going to be gas, but yes, they are diesel. And what we are um, doing is we're going to oversize the generator because we, we spoke with a couple of engineers and they said, if you oversize the generator, it works less to give you the light. Um, and with the LEDs, they're so efficient, they use less um, electricity. Mm -hmm. So the sound of the motor will be lower with the higher, um, with the more powerful generator. Right. 
No, that, I'm fine, Eric. That's that's all I had right now. Okay. All right. Harry or Nancy, anything? Any questions? Not from me. No. Okay. Good. All right. Anything else from from you two? Chair, before I open up to the town board? attorney has her hand raised. Oh. Okay. Who does? For the town attorney. Okay, Mona, Mona, go ahead. I'm sorry, that was inadvertent. I don't have anything to say right now. Okay, thank you. An attorney that doesn't have anything to say? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Just wave it at us. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, then I'll go ahead and open up the, uh, the microphone to anyone who's not on the applicant who'd like to speak on this item. I see a few people on, but I don't know if you're ready to speak. Anyone else ready to speak on this item? If you are, you're, you're on mute and you may not know it. All right, I'm not seeing anybody else coming forward. R9 from a phone to unmute. Okay. If the, app, if the individual didn't know that. Okay. There's an iPhone on that's on mute. If you're ready to talk, then let's let you, you, this is your time. If not, then I'm going to go ahead and continue the meeting. If you come back waving your arms, I'll open it back up for you. All right, then I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion and action as appropriate. Well, I, I just would like to open up the discussion with the rest of the commission about um, uh, the time that's on the request at 7 p.m. Yeah. and uh, get all of your thoughts on that and uh, talk about the possibility of, of limiting that in some right. form. And I just, I don't know the answer to that. So right. just wanted to open up that discussion within the commission. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Paul, from the standpoint of uh, there's two things that that uh, uh, I reacted to on the on the length of time on this one. One, I think the height of the lights is a factor. Two, the number of of uh, the number of noise creating devices I know was not been tested, so that's a, that's an issue. But the other is so many kids on the field is going to create a lot of noise later. Uh, and that's why I asked about what would the field would normally be used for. And you're talking about you know 60 or 80 kids as opposed to hundreds. And going later uh, was go is going to create a lot more noise later, um, and that that would be a concern from the standpoint of balancing the three things I talked about earlier. The you know the neighborhood and the uh, and the students' needs, and then you, I know you're working on all the health health aspect of it. So I I I would be uncomfortable going to seven o'clock, uh, and I uh, for for uh, you know. For that length of time, I mean, if uh, I would be more comfortable approving for a more limited period of time during the day um, or during the night, and then coming back if there's an issue, if there's no issue or whatever, then then you apply to extend, I guess. But I, I'm not comfortable with seven o'clock being the then being the cutoff time. Nancy, you're on mute. If you ever say something. Nancy, you're on mute. Okay, I'm unmuted. I don't know how that happened. I didn't mute myself. Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead. Well, I don't have a lot to say here, but I agree with what's been said thus far. And uh, if the school can justify 7 o'clock, I would be open to that. Otherwise, uh, yes, let's discuss and see if it could be a little earlier. All right. Uh, Perry, any comments on this? No. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, from the standpoint of, of limiting the time on this, uh, there's is there any legal aspect of that that I need to know about? Any legal aspect of that that I need to know about? The time is within the discretion of the Planning Commission. I would ask, however, that the Planning Commission, before it makes a decision, to confer with the applicant to make sure that um, despite the change in that condition that they are agree amenable to, and agree to all of the 
um, other conditions of the approval. All right. And you want, you're talking specifically about what? There are a number of conditions. For example, the applicant does have to indemnify and defend the town. So with the modification to the time, we would want to confirm that the applicant still yeah. wishes to have the EP granted. Got it, got it. Uh, that's, I just want to make sure that I understood that. All right, I'll, 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 bring, I'll go ahead and uh, open the public hearing so that we can have you answer that question uh, about the time. So if I could uh, address the commission on the time. So there, there's two things. One is we have to cycle through students. And, and by the way, we wouldn't have 600 on the fields at one time. Right. We have five days. And so therefore you cycle through cohorts and it's, it's a way to give everyone a chance to uh, use the fields and to get their exercise. So that's number one. Number two, the reason we asked for seven o'clock in addition to needing to do the cycles because we have a lot of students is that the um, ordinance governing schools allows for activity up to 7 p.m. during normal times. So that is why we had asked for 7 p.m. If we had asked for something later, then I would I would definitely agree that that there's an issue, uh, but perhaps the city attorney can uh, um, enlighten us on that. But that is our understanding. Yeah, but that's without lights. So I don't have a problem with you being there until seven o'clock without without lights. Uh, so that that's that is the difference. Is is tall lights? Uh, it creates a different scenario. Um, and I'm, I'm, I would question whether or not the scheduling could be done in such a way that uh, that uh, whatever would be the most dangerous thing uh, uh, be done early when the lights were more critical. Um, I mean, I understand spin class doesn't need 50, you know, 50 foot high lights unless you're uh, uh, unless it's a lot bigger bikes than I think that they are. Uh, so. Uh, what we're trying to do, what, uh, and you've seen this in the in the first hearings, is we're trying to come up with a way to uh, to give you the flexibility that you need and uh, create a minimum impact on the on the neighborhood. Right. And um, seven o'clock doesn't do enough of that. So what what I'd be looking at is something more like six thirty or six fifteen, so it's more more aligned with the other schools because. It, 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 this, although this is not precedent setting, it is it is uh, standard out there, okay. and uh, and it's an issue that we're we have to deal with overall, and we're, and we're definitely going to be dealing with it. So, uh, if you can make six fifteen work, then that would make uh, that would make it a lot uh, a lot more consistent with what we're seeing in, in right. other schools, and um, and also. Uh, if you had the lower lights in that area, it might not be as big an issue, but the higher lights, I think it's an issue. Okay. So uh, I, I guess I'm looking for sure. whatever compliance you'd have on that. Oh, okay, Mike, I, I can take it. I'm fine if we could go till 6.30. One thing I'd like to add is that we reached out to numerous neighbors. I personally talked to them and spoke to them about the seven o'clock time. We have um, responses from, uh, I think it is uh, trying to remember at least 80% of, of the parents uh, or 90% of the parents that live in Atherton and the support um, of those citizens that um, when we had asked for the 7 p.m. So if, if we need to um, back that down, um, I, I think 6.30, as Mr. Dioli is saying, would, would be something that we would be able to cycle through the uh, various groups. 6.15 would be extremely tough for us. I can research other lights, but the lights that, that we have gone with were approved by the town council. Um, so I haven't had a chance to do that. Yeah, well, it, it, so there's 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 multiple multiple aspects that, that I'm thinking through that uh, that that go back to the idea of you know uh, 
the reality of those taller lights and people realizing what that means when they're on. The second is the reality of kids being out, out on the fields that are lit later and, uh, and whatever noise that creates. Um, and uh, I think from the other standpoint, the consistency among schools in town in terms of the request that we're gonna have coming forward. So I'm comfortable with 6.30. So we'll, we'll, re we'll if you guys, if you don't, uh, now, if we went for 6.30, could you, could you agree to the stipulations you have in, the, in terms of the other uh, aspects of it uh, as, as Mona brought up? Yes. Yes. Okay, all right, good. Then I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion and action as appropriate. All right, so that's where I am. I, I know Paul, Paul and Nancy and, and Perry, you know, uh, uh, I'd like to hear any thoughts you have. This is Nancy. I think it is a reasonable thing at 6.30 and I, I, I would go along with that. Yeah, my only question about the 6.30 is, is um, and I guess I, I'm asking Mona about this is, um, how does it conflict with what we just approved with uh, Menlo School? I mean, we're, we're essentially proving the same type of CUP, but um, justifying even just a 15 minute time difference. Are we, time difference are, we, uh, are we getting ourselves into any kind of a bind? The request for Menlo School was for a shorter duration. So I think that you have that fact to support your decision to allow a longer time for Sacred Heart as opposed to the exact same time for Menlo School. Okay, that's uh, that's that's fine. I, I'm fine with 6:30. I think that is uh, a nice compromise, and uh, we need we do need to show some deference to the concerns of the neighbors as well. Harry, any thoughts on this? No, for the for the same reasons and considerations that were discussed uh, last time, uh, I, I am inclined to vote in favor of the application. Till seven. Six thirty. Till six thirty. Okay. All right. Great. All right, Nancy. Yes, I agree. All right. Then. Uh, we're ready for, uh, uh, if there's any other, uh, no more questions or comments, then we're ready for a motion. All right, well, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, and will we, we'll need to modify that in the motion as well. So I'll, I'll move uh, approval of uh, resolution number 2020, which is blank on the formal motion. Number two, 2022, let's 2022. Number two. Thank you. Which grants the conditional use permit to allow temporary use of athletic fields for outdoor recreational activities with temporary lights from January 19th, 2021 through March 12th, 2021 from the hours of 4.30 p.m. until 6.30 p.m. Monday through Friday at Palatella Football Field and Dollinger Soccer Field for Sacred Heart Schools 150 Valparaiso and finds that this CUP is exempt from CEQA. And this would only be for days that the schools are are open uh, and and weekdays, correct? Yes. Uh, the, the, this was to, to the motion, or not to you? Uh, yes, correct. Mona, you're, you got your hand up, but you're on mute. Thank you. So let the record reflect that item six B of the resolution will be amended in this motion to reflect six thirty p.m and condition one of the conditional use permit shall also be amended to reflect 6.30 p.m. and the planning commission incorporates by reference all of the factual basis to support the CEQA exemption and the findings from the Menlo School application into the Sacred Heart application. And I heard that intent in Paul's uh, motion. You're right. <laughs> all right. Uh, any any comments or questions before we take the vote? All right, and uh, Perry, you're on mute, and, that, and uh, so just to warn you. All right, uh, Lisa, you want to go to the roll call? 
I didn't catch who gave the second on that. I got to only with the motion. I'll do the second on that one. Second. Thank you. Okay, for roll call, uh, Commissioner Narancic? Yes. Commissioner Lerner? Yes. Commissioner Lamb has recused himself. Commissioner Tonelli? Yes. Chair Lane? Yes. All right, thank you, gentlemen. And I would ask you to take the same consideration about the neighborhood that I that I asked the Menlo schools to take and to stay in touch with the neighborhood and be responsive to any concerns that come up. And also uh, work with our planning staff to make sure that any issues are addressed. We will, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you for your time tonight. Before you go, before you go, Mona has her hands up. So I wanna make sure you hear what she says to say. Any person dissatisfied with a determination or action of the planning commission may appeal such action within 10 days from today and in compliance with chapter 17.06.100 of the Atherton Municipal Code. Thank you for highlighting that. All right, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. All right. Uh, actually, I put my next item is the uh, is the staff report, is that correct? There are no staff reports. All right, uh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Any commissioner reports? Uh, nope. Nope. All right, uh, then uh, Mona, do you have anything uh, else for us to, to know before we uh, go to the last item of our journey? Happy holidays. Hey, you too. And thank you for, uh, thanks for your assistance tonight. Mona. Yeah, have, have a good... Uh, have a good New Year. All right, thank you. All right, so I need a motion to adjourn. Don't everybody rush to the door so quickly. <laughs> We're having so much fun. Uh, I, I move to adjourn. I will say. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Nancy. Both well, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll say Paul got that one. Paul got that one. Okay, okay. First, Paul, second. All right, uh, roll call, please, Lisa. You're on mute. Yeah, there you go. Commissioner Narancic. Yes. Commissioner Lerner? Yes. Commissioner Lamb has recused, is it still excused? Commissioner Tonelli? Uh, absolutely yes. Chair Lane? For the last time in a year, absolutely yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone have a safe New Year's and we'll see you uh, late January. And uh, and uh, so let's see, late January, what, the, the meeting in January is like the 20th? Yeah, uh, 21st, 21st. See, I'll, I'll still be it's 60. It's the 27th. 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 Oh, 60, that was I'll, I'll still be 67 for three more days then. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll Wait, hold you on. You'll, you'll, you'll still be uh, 12 years younger than the president. <laughs> oh, there's an idea. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for showing thank up. You. Thank you for all thank for you. doing your job. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good luck in uh, 2021, everyone. Bye. Yeah.